I have talked about the hydrostatic stress regime where these elements are same. Now here a good hint can come what will happen if I am dealing with a stress matrix such as this sigma 1 1, sigma 2 1, sigma 3 1, sigma 1 2, sigma 1 3, sigma 2 2, sigma 2 3, sigma 3 2 and sigma 3 3 and again where sigma ij equal to sigma ji because of the no rotation and the stability of the tetrahedron. In that case, we can decompose it into a mean stress component and the divisoric stress component. We have been doing it frequently. If we decompose into and only consider the mean stress component, then it looks something like this. These elements are the same and that is equal to sigma m. So, for the mean stress component, when you find out the relation amongst i1, i2, i3, do you get this kind of relationship? I am keeping it open-ended for the students. It will not be difficult for you to answer. Here I am going to give an exercise for the students. Write down the sigma matrix in as a 3 into 3 matrix and then write it in terms of the mean stress and the divisoric stress summation. We already know the I1, I2, I3 invariance for the sigma formula was given. Applying that formula, find out the I1M, I2M and I3M for the sigma M matrix and similarly applying the formula of I1, I2, I3, find out the sigma D, sig I for sigma D, I, I, D, I, 2, D and I, 3, D. The question here is, is it true that I1 equal to I1, M plus I1, D? Is it true that I2 equal to I2, M plus I2, D? Is it true that I3 is equal to I3, M plus I3, D? In other words, is it true that I i is equal to I i m plus I i d? So once you have got these three expressions, these three and those three by adding you can check is it true or false. Consider it is suppose you find out it is false and then is, can you find out any special situation when this relationship will hold true and if that special algebraic relation is found does it indicate any special geological situation? special physical meaning. We will now take a special stress regime where sigma ij equal to 0 for i not equal to j that means these elements are zeros and this diagonal none of them are zeros or at least in none of the situations three of them are zero. Such a stress matrix we have already seen in various problems today. But the question is what is so special about sigma 1 1, sigma 2 2 and sigma 3 3? The answer can be straight away given here itself, but we will follow the equation and see what it come, turns out. So that which was stated here, we will now change to this form. These are the zero elements. Now if this is expanded, what will happen? Sigma 1 1 minus sigma multiplied by sigma 2 2 minus sigma multiplied by sigma 3 3 minus sigma is equal to 0. Now this is a cubic equation of sigma and it has three roots and those roots are sigma 1 1, sigma 2 2, sigma 3 3. Clearly I can see if I put sigma equal to sigma 1 1 over here then whatever are those values it becomes 0. Similarly for sigma 2 2 equal to sigma and sigma 3 3 equal to sigma this expression becomes equal to 0. So, Sigma 1 1, sigma 2 2 and sigma 3 3 are basically the principal stresses. Why we are saying so? Now from the common sense also we can validate. This is such a stress regime that there is no shear stress acting on let us say on a small cube and only the three perpendicular direction compression is acting. So sigma 1 1, sigma 2 2 and sigma 3 3 are the nothing but the principal stresses. So if that we are considering a stress regime where three perpendicular stress are acting then this becomes the matrix and the three roots of the characteristic equation are these three elements of the matrix itself. Now a special kind of this kind of matrix is the hydrostatic stress regime where these three elements are equal. So in that case what happens the three roots are 
सिग्मा इक्वल टू से सिग्मा जीरो कॉमा सिग्मा जीरो कॉमा सिग्मा जीरो हाइड्रोस्टैटिक स्ट्रेस रेजिम वेयर फ्रॉम द थ्री पार्पेंडिकुलर डायरेक्शन सेम अमाउंट ऑफ स्ट्रेस एक्ट्स एंड नो शेयर स्ट्रेस एक्ट्स ऑन द स्मॉल क्यूब दीज आर ऑब्वियस थिंग्स वर्क एंड द इक्वेशन एंड ट्राइंग टू अंडरस्टैंड वेरियस सिम्प्लीफाइड केसेस सो दैट वी हैव बेटर अंडरस्टैंडिंग ऑन द कॉशी स्ट्रेस टेट्राइट्रॉन we have seen by solving the characteristic equation one can find out the principal stress magnitudes now we want to find out the direction cosine of the principal directions along which the principal stresses are acting so for this we will solve taking a numerical example and the explanation will be easier so here we take a stress regime with such a magnitude of stress 0.3919.5916 and minus 0.9836. Suppose plus indicates compressive stress, then minus will indicate extensional stress. These three are the normal stresses. These are compressive. This is extensional because here is a minus symbol. And these value 0.4816 and these numbers here, here, here. These are the sigma ij value when i not equal to j. And you observe that here we are considering. सिग्मा आई जे इक्वल टू सिग्मा जे आई वेन आई नॉट इक्वल टू जे फॉर एग्जाम्पल पॉइंट फोर एट वन सिक्स हियर एंड पॉइंट फोर एट वन सिक्स सो सिग्मा आई जे इक्वल टू सिग्मा जे आई सिमिलरली हियर पॉइंट वन टू जीरो टू एंड पॉइंट वन टू जीरो टू एंड हियर पॉइंट वन थ्री फोर थ्री एंड पॉइंट वन थ्री फोर थ्री ए पेयर ऑफ शेयरिंग स्ट्रेसेज आर सेम नाउ यूजिंग द कैरेक्टरिस्टिक इक्वेशन वन कैन फाइंड आउट दैट द आई वन वैल्यू इज नियरली इक्वल टू जीरो द आई टू वैल्यू इज ऑलमोस्ट इक्वल टू माइनस वन एंड आई थ्री वैल्यू इज नियरली इक्वल टू जीरो I will request the students to take these numbers and proceed and find out these values. Now the characteristic equation then simplifies to the sigma cube minus sigma equal to zero, and this cubic equation has three roots zero, one, and minus one for this sigma. Now we will recollect these three equations from which actually we constructed this stress matrix, and here we are going to consider first substitute sigma equal to one in this expression. so here it is equal to 1 we have taken and we also know the sigma 1 1 or sigma 1 sigma 2 1 and the sigma 3 1 values these are here so once those are given as input we find this equation similarly put sigma equal to 1 in this equation 2 that means here i put it is equal to 1 now i also know the sigma 1 2 sigma 2 2 and the sigma 3 2 values from the matrix once those are input then we get this equation 4 now this equation 4 has got three unknowns l1 l2 and l3 but what can be done is that l1 can be eliminated once that is being done we get a relationship between l2 and l3 from there find out the ratio l3 divide by l2 as that number now similarly we can find out from equation 3 and 4 from these two equation by eliminating l3 l3 can be eliminated we will get a relation between l1 and l2 and from there we can find out l1 by l2 is equal to such a number so we have got basically two ratios l3 by l2 and l1 by l2 by the way what is l2 by l2 of course that is 1 and for that i don't need the l2 value so taking this l1 by l2 the direction ratio for the line along which the sigma stress equal to 1 is acting a1 value the direction ratio is 0.7848 which is this number l1 by l2 then a2 is equal to l2 by l2 which is equal to 1 for which i don't need the value of l2 right now and then l3 by l2 is obtained as 0.1175 which is stated over there now once a1 a2 and a3 are worked out we can find out square root of sum of a1 square a2 square and a3 square now once this number is found a1 divided by this is equal to l1 value a2 divided by that is equal to the l2 value and a3 equal to that divided by this number whatever comes out is equal to l3 and that is equal to that number so in this way the l1 the l2 and the l3 value have been obtained so these are the direction cosines of the principal direction along which sigma equal to 1 magnitude of principal stress has worked in this way starting from the other value such as sigma equal to 
0 and sigma equal to minus 1, we will be able to find out the direction cosine of the other two principal directions along which the principal stresses are acting. We have seen starting from the Cauchy stress tetrahedron how the stress matrix has been constructed. Similarly, we can also look strain in terms of a matrix with 3 into 3 total 9 number of elements. So, here is the strain matrix epsilon 1 1, epsilon 2 1, epsilon 3 1, this is epsilon 1 2, epsilon 2 2, epsilon 3 2, epsilon 1 3, epsilon 2 3 and epsilon 3 3. Here the epsilon 1 1, epsilon 2 2 and epsilon 3 3 in other words epsilon i i indicates normal strain. That means perpendicular to a plane the strain that takes place and the epsilon i j is known as shear strain if i not equal to j. So, these are the different shear strains. Okay. We can find out the determinant d epsilon and then it will make it 0 and we will write here minus epsilon, minus epsilon and minus epsilon. Our aim is to find out the principal extensions epsilon 1, epsilon 2 and epsilon 3. In case of principal stress, we were looking at 3 roots of sigma as sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3. Here the 3 roots of epsilon will be epsilon 1, epsilon 2 and epsilon 3 as a principal extension. What does this mean in a deforming body? The body might be extending in various ways, but it is possible to constrain its deformation in terms of 3 mutually perpendicular directions 1, 2 and 3 in this case where all extensions take place along those directions and no shear strain work. Now similarly, the characteristic equation can be written as epsilon q minus i1 dash epsilon square plus i2 dash epsilon minus i3 dash equal to 0. Here we can speed up the reason is same logic goes as was done for the stress which is already explained. So now i1 dash the first invariant is given by epsilon 1 1 plus epsilon 2 2 plus epsilon 3 3 which is equal to 3 multiplied by epsilon m. Epsilon m is the mean extension along the 3 perpendicular direction which is given by sum of these 3 divided by 3. So that is why this is equal to 3 times the mean strain. Now i2 dash is given by epsilon 1 1, epsilon 2 2 and this expression. Basically you have seen similar expression when you were dealing with stress. If you replace epsilon by sigma it goes back to the our case of when we were dealing with the Cauchy stress tetrahedron. i3 dash is equal to epsilon 1 1, epsilon 2 2, epsilon 3 3 plus this etc. We will now see some other expressions. Now we are going to see more about the strain tensor and the 3 into 3 matrix what else we can do. Here we can represent a strain tensor as sum of the two coaxial strain tensors here epsilon 1 1 minus epsilon m same subtraction is done here and there these are the minus symbols and here is a minus. So it is familiar to you by now this looks like a deviatoric stress tensor and in this case we call it as a deviatoric strain tensor. This leads to the or the strain divider and it leads to the change in the shape of the material. And then there is an epsilon m which is given by here this epsilon m multiplied by i3 that is called the mean strain also called as the spherical tensor. This can change the size of the material but not the shape. Now volumetric strain or dilation is given by delta equal to change in volume per unit original volume which is sum of epsilon 1 1, epsilon 2 2 and epsilon 3 3. Basically, if I sum only these elements, I will get the volumetric strain. We cannot subtract any number over there arbitrarily to define the deviatoric strain tensor, rather we need to subtract the mean strain value. So, needless to mention here, the oh, this has to be epsilon m. Epsilon m is given by epsilon i i and sum and then divide by 3. So, if I find that the sum of epsilon 1 1, epsilon 2 2 and epsilon 3 3 is equal to 0, we can say that there is no volume change of the material. For example, if I very quickly write such a matrix 2 minus 7 and then here 
5 and here are certain numbers stated. I can see that the sum of these three elements is equal to 0. So immediately we say that there is no dilation. The volume has remained the same during the course of deformation. We have seen from the stress matrix how to find out the characteristic equation, find out the I1, I2, I3 values and then solve the principal stress magnitudes and then finally go to the uh, direction cosines of those principal directions. Starting from a strain matrix, we can find out the principal strain magnitudes, the characteristic equation, the I1 dash, I2 dash and the I3 dash invariants and finally we can also find out the direction cosines of the principal directions along which the principal strains are working. Let us consider this matrix as a strain matrix. So we can clearly see in this case that this is the epsilon 1 1, this is epsilon 2 2, this is epsilon 3 3 and a quick observation that if I sum them up, trace of this matrix, if I sum up it turns out to be 0. Although not asked in the problem, we understand there is no volume change in this deformation. Now let us look at the epsilon ij value when i not equal to j. I find that these two are same, this value and that value are the same and then these values are the same. That means here we are dealing with a case of epsilon ij equal to epsilon ji for i not equal to j. This is a case when the sigma ij equal to sigma ji for i not equal to j has been applied, the body has not. This is similar to the case when sigma ij is applied when sigma ij is same as sigma ji when i is not equal to j and the body has not rotated. In that case epsilon ij also is equal to epsilon ji that is being considered here. Now here we get using the formulae i1 dash equal to i3 dash equal to 0 and i2 dash is equal to minus 0 0.25. The characteristic equation in that case reduces to epsilon q minus 0.25 epsilon equal to 0. Clearly epsilon has two values 0.5 minus 0.5 and 0. Now if I take one of these values and substitute in the equation, I will get L1 by L2 equal to this and L3 by L2 equal to that. Without knowing L2 value, I can say L2 by L2 is equal to also 1. From there, we can find out the L1 value, the L2 value and the L3 value. L1, L2, L3 are basically the direction cosines for the principal strain. So likewise taking the other two values and putting in the equation. So in this way we have also found out the principal strain magnitudes and their direction cosines starting from the given strain matrix. We have got some idea about the stress tensor and also the strain tensor of second rank. Now we are going to use both of them to start with Hooke's law of isotropic material Consider this is the I1 axis, this is the I3 axis and perpendicular to the green board is the I2 axis shown in this way. Now consider a cube that we are going to deform which is drawn by an orange line. So the cube is look, we are looking at the cube from the top. So that is why we are seeing as a square. Now if I apply a force Fa in this direction, what is the direction? towards direction 3. This Fa force we are applying on this face of the cube which is not shown, which is inside. If, I, if you go inside or think outside, put your hand on this, you are applying the Fa amount of force. Now because of that, if I am pulling the cube, imagine it is deformable and by pulling this orange uh, square becomes this blue rectangle. So we can see that this length has increased. Say the increase in length is delta 3a. So the total length blue line, this length of the rectangle is a plus delta 3a, where a is the starting length of the individual sides of the square, such as this is a, this is a, that is a and this is a. Now as the material is pulled in this direction and it has gained its length in its perpendicular direction, consider it is it has undergone some shrinking. The amount of shrinking let us say is delta 1a. 
So this por this portion and that portion, if you add up, say it is delta 1a. So now the total length or the width of this blue rectangle is a minus delta 1a. Now we can consider f a, this force that was applied divided by a square is equal to the stress sigma a. Why this a square is coming? As I told you, although not shown in the diagram, look at my hand and assume that this is the face of the cube and I am pulling in this way. All sides of the cube have got the length a. So, this face has a, an area of a square force per unit area is equal to the stress. We will consider in, the, in this deformation all cubic faces remain perpendicular to each other. For a small deformation this is true for rocks and for other solids. If the deformation is huge it may not be true and it is true when it is an isotropic material. Now we can write this epsilon 1 and then there is a small circle just to indicate this is a one kind of epsilon 1 which is equal to the epsilon 2 with this small circle indicating it is a kind of epsilon 2. We are going to see other epsilon 1, epsilon 2 subsequently then we will be using dash epsilon 1 dash epsilon 1 double dash. So here this small circle and this is not a dot. This does not indicate d epsilon dt in this case. So this is given by the change in length per unit length and this change in length and per unit length. And for a small deformation we can consider these two to be the same. So epsilon 1 dot and epsilon 2 dot can be the same. Now due to this uniaxial load here we have considered an extension. We can generalize it and call it a uniaxial load instead of extension what has happened this might be compression and some changes will happen in the formulation. Only along the sigma 3 direction I3 you see that is sigma 3 has acted and sigma 3 here I can write sigma A as sigma 3 is given by 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 and sigma 3. These are the shear stresses like earlier I was using tau 1, 2 symbol, it was like tau 1, 1, tau 1, 2, tau 1, 3, tau 2, 1, tau 2, 2, tau 2, 3 and tau 3, 1, tau 3, 2 and tau 3, 3. So only this one is present, rest of all the terms are zeros. But we have seen as this stress is applied in three perpendicular direction there has been strain. And so I can write this is epsilon 1 and then the small circle epsilon 2 and epsilon 3. Note that in such a deformation for an isotropic material no shear stress has been produced. That means you take a cube and perpendicular to any face give a pull or a push if the body deforms there will be no shear stress produced for an isotropic body. And we can say that as per the experience small deformation this sigma a is proportional to the epsilon i and then this small circle. So this can be epsilon 1, epsilon 2 or epsilon 3, the three strains. And here by the way we are instead of sigma a we have already written it as sigma 3. Now what are the relations? The epsilon 3 is given by sigma 3 by e, e is the Young's modulus and it can vary for rocks from 10 to the power 4 to 10 to the power 5 mega Pascal. For different rocks there must be some list of E available in the literature and if, if you are dealing with a specific rock type you can have an idea what is the range of its E value. And then the epsilon 1 and epsilon 2 with these small circles equal to minus nu multiplied by epsilon 3 and this symbol. This nu is called the Poisson's ratio and it varies from solids in ideal cases from minus 1 to 0 0.5. If we are dealing with the rocks, it has generally been seen that nu varies between 0.2 to 0.35 for many rocks and commonly for the mathematical models we take nu equal to 0.25. But if you have a chance of having the actual Poisson's ratio value for the rock in the laboratory experiment, instead of taking 0.25 you might be taking 0.27. So here the new term has come and then we can replace this epsilon 3 and this small circle by this term. This is coming from the Hooke's law. So these are the different expressions of epsilon 1, epsilon 2 and epsilon 3 in this case. 
So this was all about when the deformation was induced along direction 3, normal stress was given and normal strains have been produced. Now we will take another uniaxial load that I am writing as u dot l along direction 1. Where is direction 1 here? This is the direction 1. That means think of this face of the cube, my right hand and apply a normal stress either extensional or compressional on this, either this or that. And once that is being done, how the stress matrix will look like? Only sigma 1 1 is applied, which is in my previous notation tau 1 1. Instead of sigma 1 1, I can write simply as sigma 1, rest all of them are zeros. We have not applied any other stresses. And in that case also similarly, we will produce the normal strains. And just like this deduction was made, we can similarly write epsilon 1 dash is equal to sigma 1 by E that comes from the Hooke's law and epsilon 2 dash and epsilon 3 dash you might be looking here and accordingly you can write minus nu E inverse, this is not F, this is E and then here it was sigma 3, when sigma 3 was applied, here sigma 1 is applied, so it is sigma 1. Similarly, if we apply a uniaxial load along direction 2, now where is direction 2? Please bring the camera here. This is my direction 2. So that means if this is a face of a cube and you apply either compression or extension, but uniaxial only along one axis. In that case, only sigma 2 2 or tau 2 2 is acting. Instead of sigma 2 2 or tau 2 2, I am writing as sigma 2. And then also the normal strains will be produced, no shear strain will be produced for the isotropic material which, has, which can also be validated from the laboratory experiments. So here what we can write, epsilon 2 double dash is equal to sigma 2 by E, this is coming from the Hooke's law and epsilon 1 double dash and epsilon 3 double dash will be equal to minus nu by E sigma 2. Since sigma 2 was applied, so I get right here sigma 2. In this case, sigma 3 was applied, so I wrote here sigma 3 and uh, in another case, sigma 1 was applied, so I wrote here sigma 1. So these equations have a some sort of repetitiveness. So once these are being done, what we have got? We have taken a cube isotropic material along direction 1, we have applied a normal stress and the normal strain in three directions have been obtained along direction 2 separately imagine we have applied a normal stress V compressive or extensional and in the three direction we have got the strain in three perpendicular directions no shear strains produced and same in direction 3. Now we will see what we will do with this strain matrix, this stress matrix, this stress matrix and this strain matrix and this stress matrix and that strain matrix. We are going to one step ahead of it.